welcome everyone to our Anne Klebanski visiting lecture um, series, lecture relative hormone deficiency in obesity. And it's my great, great pleasure to welcome back Catherine Backman, who was a fellow with us, and also Laura Dicktel, one of our current faculty here. I want to say this uh, session will be recorded, made available off the CFD website, but only I think part of it, Brenda, correct me if I'm wrong. Now I would like to say a few words to about the visiting and Klebanski Visiting Scholar Award, and I will be brief. Um, we know that COVID-19 pandemic disproportionately affects women and with additional child care and household responsibilities. And also, even before COVID, women were less likely to be visiting professors because of challenges related to travel. And now with the COVID-19 related travel ban, most current rounds in visiting professorships are conducted virtually. So we used the silver lining and created the Anne Klebanski Visiting Scholar Award to um, allow women faculty, educators, researchers, and postdocs at MGH to serve as virtual visiting professor at national or international institutions. And these talks are organized by the Center for Faculty Development. And so far we have awarded 68 women um, with an Anne Klebanski Visiting Scholar Award. And our women also receive mentoring and professional coaching and leadership training. It's named after Anne Klebanski, our president and CEO of Mass General Brigham, the former director of the CFD, so my predecessors, and also the former head of the neuroendocrine unit and a mentor of of our both of our speakers today. This is the first cohort of Anne Klebanski visiting scholars and I want to highlight Laura Dicktel, mm -hmm. our speaker today. And here are some of the institutions where our scholars have given lectures and I want to highlight mm -hmm. Vanderbilt University because that's where our guest speaker is coming from. And here is the second cohort of uh, scholars. So in order to promote as many women as possible at MGH, the US and the world, we started the Anne Klebanski Visiting Lecture Series, where we now invite also women faculty from the host institution to give a joint lecture with our, um, our, our scholars. And this is really to not only advance the careers of as many women as possible, but also to foster collaboration across institutions. So now it's my great, great pleasure to introduce um, to you, Catherine Backman, who um, actually I've known for a long time. She's an endocrinologist and clinical researcher at Vanderbilt University Medical Center and at the Nashville VA Medical Center. She moved to Nashville in 2015. I can't believe it's been that long after <laughs> completing her endocrinology fellowship at MGH under the mentorship of Dr. Karen Miller and Dr. Anne Klebanski. And Karen is here today and she is one of the champions of the Anne Klebanski Scholar Award. So thank you, Karen, for everything you have been doing in that realm. And Dr. Backman also holds a VA Career Development Award, which funds her clinical research in obesity-induced cardiometabolic complications um, with a particular focus on the natri natriuretic peptide system. And I'm also going to introduce our second speaker, Laura Dicktel who is an endocrinologist at MGH and in the Neuroendocrine Pituitary Clinical Center where she primarily cares, primarily cares for patients with pituitary disorders. And her research is how hormone dysregulation across the weight spectrum affects metabolic health and disease with a particular interest in the impact of growth hormone on non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And Laura and I also have been working together for a very long time, probably, um, yeah, more than five years. So I will stop sharing. And I think Catherine, you're first. So please share your slides. Okay. Thank you so much for that, uh, for that introduction. And as I'm pulling up my slides and just make sure I'm on the right page of this, uh, I just wanted to thank you so much for the invitation to speak here. Um, oh, sorry about that. Um, that was crazy sounding. Um, thank you so much for the invitation to speak. I'm really honored uh, to speak uh, in this forum today. I have very fond uh, memories and thoughts for Mass General, as you know, from the time I spent there in fellowship and the continued relationships and collaborations um, you know, since that time. Uh, and so it's so nice to be speaking with Laura, who was we were co-fellows together and here with uh, you know, Karen, Karen and uh, and Miriam and Melanie, and of course, uh, in, in honor of uh, Ann Klebanski setting this up, and I was so fortunate to receive mentorship from her as well. So thank you all. So today, 
Um, I'll be speaking about relative hormone deficiencies in obesity, uh, natriuretic peptide hormones. So this is an outline of my talk for, the, for today. Uh, I'd like to start out by kind of giving an introduction to the physiology of the natriuretic peptide hormonal system. And I will abbreviate this NP throughout the rest of the talk. So you'll see that abbreviation a lot. Uh, then I'll, I'll start talking about what are the determinants of circulating NP levels in humans. And then finally end with the idea of whether or not an NP hormonal deficiency can exist in humans. So I like to think about the NP system as the hormonal system of the heart. So in response to elevated cardiac wall stress, which can occur in the setting of increases in, in uh, volume status and it increases in blood pressure, the cardiomyocytes of the heart uh, produce and secrete atrial natriuretic peptide, abbreviated ANP, and B-type natriuretic peptide, abbreviated BNP. And then the NPs go out into the, the circulation uh, and uh, act at the target organs, including the kidneys and the vasculature, and cause naturesis, so uh, salt excretion in the urine, vasodilation, and inhibition of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Uh, and the neat thing is, is that these effects actually then serve to serve to partially alleviate the stressors that initiated their response, their release in the first place, because they help kind of they help. Uh, release uh, some volume overload um, and pressure in the cardiac walls. So it's kind of similar to other hormonal systems. And so for this reason, uh, so the, N that the roles in salt and water regulation of the NPs are very well recognized. And for this reason, most people, when they think about natriuretic peptides, think about them as their use as biomarkers for volume overload, often in the setting of heart failure. So both BNP as well as N-terminal pro-B-type natriuretic peptide, abbreviated NT pro-BNP, are very commonly used as biomarkers for heart failure. In addition, in recent years, we've actually realized that the NPs have other effects on other organs, including some metabolic effects. So here is kind of a summary of some of the NP's physiologic effects. And so we already talked about the effects on you know, the kidneys and the vasculature. Uh, but in addition, NPs actually do have some metabolic effects in adipose tissue. They promote lipolysis and they appear to also stimulate insulin secretion. So what do we know about the NP system uh, in terms of animal models? So in animal models of excess NP production, so for instance, um, there are animal models of BNP overexpressing mice. They see that these mice are subject to hypotension, which makes sense if you think about you know, an, an excessive amount of salt and water excretion could lead to hypotension. In addition, they actually have some favorable metabolic effects. So these when placed on a high fat diet, BNP overexpressing mice gain less weight compared to wild type mice. And they have less accumulation of both visceral fat and total fat when on a high fat diet. And they are partially protected against glucose intolerance while on a high fat diet. In addition, these BNP overexpressing mice have increased oxygen consumption and fat oxidation on a high fat diet. And in a different model of NP overexpression, uh, we see, uh, so mice that lack the NP clearance receptor uh, thus have elevated NP activity because they're not clearing the natural peptides as much. So this is just another model of NP overexpression. So these mice actually have a higher expression of genes associated with brown and beige fat. And so just as a quick overview about types of adipose tissue, in our bodies, the majority of the fat are going to be just wh white fat, which are uh, usually basically the primary purpose is for storage. It's a single large lipid droplet with few mitochondria. In contrast, the, there is a minority of fat in our bodies, which is brown fat, uh, which shares developmental origin with muscle. Uh, and the, these fat cells have many mitochondria and they express UCP1 or uncoupling protein one. And the neat thing about that is that it allows these fat cells to be able uh, to be capable of thermogenesis, essentially to burn off energy as heat. And so for that reason, people have been, you know, uh, can get excited about this as a possibility 
of a way to treat obesity and obesity-induced metabolic dysfunction. But as I said, the amount of brown fat in adult humans is pretty small, but there's an attractive idea of what if you could take the white fat of which we have lots of that in our bodies. And if you could induce them to take on properties of brown fat, uh, that could potentially be uh, you know, a, a more you know, powerful mechanism to induce, uh, to treat obesity. So there is a term for that and it is, uh, and the, the term for that is beiging or beige fats. It's kind of a cute name with white becoming brown. So you call it beige. And there are certain stimuli that can cause this. So for instance, cold stimulants can do it. Beta-3 agonists can do it. And interestingly, it appears that natriuretic peptides may also be able to do this. So uh, this is the data showing that in mice that over that overexpress NPs, they have increase um, they have increased um, uh, expression of UCP1 in both brown adipose tissue and white adipose tissue, which is a sign of beijing. So this here is just a summary of what we were talking about with the animal models and in the mice that overexpress BNP having some of these favorable metabolic effects. And in addition, uh, and in, I guess in contrast, uh, knockout mice, so that have very little ANP or BNP, are susceptible to salt-sensitive hypertension, cardiac hypertrophy, and cardiac fibrosis. So what are the determinants of circulating NP levels in humans? So one important determinant is BMI. We see that obese, that compared to lean individuals, obese individuals have significantly lower circulating NP levels. And this is in healthy, uh, otherwise healthy people, not people with heart failure. Uh, with obese individuals having the lowest NP levels, lean people having the highest, and then overweight is in between. So it's a strong linear relationship, linear relationship by which BNP levels are lower, the higher your BMI is. And interestingly, after surgical weight loss, the low NP levels that are observed in obese individuals actually partially normalize after surgical weight loss. So it seems that this is partially correctable. It's possible also that the, that, uh, the relationship between obesity and low NPs may be possibly at least partially explained by hyperinsulinemia. So uh, both, uh, both obesity and insulin resistance as assessed by HOMA IR are independently uh, associated with lower NP levels and in epidemiologic co cohorts. And in epidemiologic cohorts, when you look at people based on different metabolic subtypes, um, so lean versus obese, but also insulin resistant versus insulin sensitive, we see that obese and people who are also insulin resistant have the lowest natriuretic peptides. Uh, lean insulin sensitive people have the highest natriuretic peptides, but lean individuals who are also insulin resistant still have significantly lower natriuretic peptides. So all this to suggest that it, it appears that low NP levels are independently associated with high insulin levels and that, uh, and that the relationship between obesity and low NPs may be partially mediated by insulin resistance. So in addition, um, sex is a very strong determinant of NP levels. So interestingly, circulating NP levels are about 40% lower in healthy men compared with healthy women, which makes sex the single largest determinant of inter-individual variability in NP levels among healthy individuals. And so what is responsible for these sex-specific differences in NP levels? Could gonadal steroids like testosterone and estradiol possibly play a role? So this was an epidemiologic study looking at NP levels in men versus women. And among the women, they were stratified by different estrogen statuses. So uh, looking at women uh, who are postmenopausal versus premenopausal, and those who were on hormone therapy versus not on hormone therapy. And the main take home point of this, of this slide that I want you to go away with is that there were some small, relatively small differences in the NP levels among women of different estrogen statuses. But the magnitude of these differences among any of the groups of women are much smaller than the huge difference between the NP levels of men compared to any of these groups of women. So for instance, you know, the postmenopausal women not on hormone therapy would be expected to have very low estrogen levels, yet 
they still there were there were still huge differences in NP levels where the men still had much lower NP levels than than any of the groups of women. Interestingly, in this same study, we found that higher free testosterone levels were associated with lower NP levels um, among men and among women, uh, suggesting that maybe well, testosterone actually see. plays a big role. Um, and again, this was in an observational study. So this led us to hypothesize that potentially testosterone could suppress natriuretic peptide production. And we wanted to investigate this hypothesis using a randomized design. So this is a publication um, that I think is was really exciting and I like it because I think it also has a neat story behind it. So this was a publication that um, I actually had started when I was a fellow at MGH um, and along with Laura Dictel, my co-fellow at the time and Karen, our mentor, and we collaborated with Joel Finkelstein on a randomized study that he was doing. Um, so we were all at MGH at the time and then we then collaborated with Tommy Wang, who had been at MGH, but then moved to Vanderbilt uh, to be the chief of cardiology over at Vanderbilt. So we started this project back in like 2013 when we were, when Laura and I were fellows. And then I graduated from fellowship, moved to, moved to Vanderbilt uh, in 2015. And then we finished this project after that time. Um, and then published it in this high uh, impact cardiology journal. So I just think it's a really neat, oh, and I kind of highlighted here for fun, you know, the, the people who are at MGH and the people who are at Vanderbilt. So you see that, you know, the great kind of collaborations and relationships that developed with this, on this project over time. So, uh, and I think it was a neat study, <laughs> so which I'll tell you about. So, uh, so in this study, this was, there were 151 healthy men who um, all received a GnRH analog to suppress, completely suppress production of their gonadal steroids. In addition, they all received an aromatase inhibitor to suppress the conversion of testosterone to estradiol. And then they were randomized to 12 weeks of either placebo gel or testosterone gel of various doses. And then we looked, uh, at their NP level. So here's a so here's a slide showing with uh, changes in log serum testosterone level with re regard to their testosterone dose. So uh, the main point here that I wanted to show is that the intervention worked, and that the men who um, received placebo gel after receiving the GnRH analog, um, they their testosterone levels, as expected, became ex dropped considerably. And their mean testosterone level is something like 30. So very, very low testosterone levels. And in this group, uh, so here we're showing NT pro BNP with regard to testosterone. Uh, in this group of men who became profoundly hypogonadal, whose testosterone levels dropped significantly, they had significant increases in their BNP levels. And we found that each one gram increase in testosterone dose was associated with a 4.3% lower NT pro BNP level at follow-up after multivariable adjustment for other factors that we know um, influence NP levels. And in this slide, we show changes in uh, circulating NT pro BNP levels with uh, regard to changes in serum circulating testosterone levels. And we see here that circulating NP levels, uh, changes in circulating NP levels were inversely associated with changes in circulating testosterone levels. Again, with this placebo, the placebo group who became profoundly hypogonadal, having large increases in their NT pro BNP levels. And in mo some modeling that we did, we saw that it an individual whose serum testosterone decreased by 500 nanograms per deciliter, which is kind of some of the differences you'll see between men and women in their testosterone levels. We saw that these people whose testosterone decreased significantly would have a 23% higher predicted follow-up NT pro BNP than someone whose testosterone remained constant. So from this study, we concluded that um, testosterone likely has an inhibitory effect on circulating NP levels and that testosterone may explain part, but likely not all of the differences in NP levels between healthy men and women. Uh, and then I'd like to also show, briefly show some data from one of my collaborators here at Vanderbilt, Deepak Gupta, who is very interested in racial differences in circulating NP levels. So he examined NP levels in multiple epidemiologic cohorts across the country and very consistently found that in 
relatively healthy individuals without heart failure, Blacks had significantly lower NP levels compared to whites, and that this relationship was very strong and persisted even after uh, adjustment for lots of other factors. So this brings up the question about NP deficiency. Uh, so to kind of sum up what, we, what we've been discussing, in large cohort studies of healthy individuals, NP concentrations are lower in obese compared with lean individuals, in men compared with women, and in blacks compared with whites. And so could these lower levels of NPs uh, actually represent you know, states of relative NP deficiency? Or is it just kind of you know, normal variations that are not actually pathologic? So I'd like to kind of bring up a little thought experiment with you. So, you know, as an endocrinologist, I love to think about, you know, different states of horm hormonal deficiency and excess. And so for most hormones in the body, we have kind of known states of deficiency and excess. So for instance, cortisol, the hormone produced by the adrenal gland, there is a clearly defined state of deficiency and we call it adrenal insufficiency. There's also a defined state of cortisol excess that we call Cushing syndrome. Same with thyroid, same with insulin, same with growth hormone that Dr. Dictel is gonna talk about growth hormone later in the hour. But interestingly with natriuretic peptides, um, you know, the, the hormones of the heart, it's not actually known in humans whether or not there's a true state of NP deficiency or an, of NP excess. So this was the slide I showed you earlier about the physiologic effects of NPs. And so then I'd like to put this another way saying that okay, if we know that NPs cause things like lowering filling pressures of the heart, if you had a deficiency of NPs, you could presumably imagine that these people would be subject to cardiac hypertrophy and diastolic dysfunction. Um, and if you have, uh, since we know that NPs can promote lipolysis um, in adipose tissue, one could presume that if you had an impairment of this, could this contribute to obesity? So, and this was a slide I was showing earlier about animal models. And so, you know, we have these animal models of, the, of uh, kind of two little NPs and how they're susceptible to hypertension. So what do we know in humans? So in, from human genetic investigations, they've discovered uh, you know, certain variants um, that can lead to variations in NP levels. So this here is a variant in the uh, promoter for ANP that leads in people with a certain genetic variant that have about 20% lower circulating ANP levels. They have a 10 to 15% higher risk of hypertension, and they also have a higher, um, higher left ventricular mass. And interestingly, people with these lower ANP levels also have higher risk of obesity and metabolic syndrome. Um, and so uh, suggesting that perhaps maybe there is sort of a deficient phenotype. Um, so just uh, to kind of summarize what we were saying, in these large cohort studies, NP levels are lower in obese individuals in men and in blacks. These groups also have higher rates of hypertension and cardiovascular disease. And we talked about how the NP system may protect against hypertension and cardiovascular disease. So is it possible that a relative NP deficiency in these groups may contribute to higher rates of hypertension and cardiovascular disease observed in these groups? So we did a study using uh, Vanderbilt synthetic derivative, uh, abbreviated SD, which is basically Vanderbilt's de-identified electronic medical record, uh, which contains uh, re records of patients over the past 25 or 30 years. And we kind of took an example of thinking, we kind of used some other hormonal states as a thought experiment to help think of this. So for instance, when you think about cortisol and you think about, well, when would you expect to have a high cortisol level. Um, so for instance, you know, a cortisol level, if you think about like a cortisol level of 10, in someone who's walking around and uh, walking around healthy, cortisol level of 10 may be completely appropriate for them. However, if you think about someone who's hypotensive in the ICU, cortisol level of 10 seems inappropriately low for that setting. So similarly, thinking about when would you expect to have high BNP levels, when that would be kind of physiologically appropriate. And remembering that BNP and ANP should be stimulated by increased cardiac wall stress. So thinking about that, we, we, we brainstormed these groups 
and said, and we thought about three groups who we thought should have very elevated BNP levels. So, uh, so we thought we found people who are hospitalized for heart failure, people with abnormal cardiac structure or function based on echocardiogram, and people with elevated, very elevated cardiac filling pressures based on cardiac catheterization. That all of these people you would think should have high BNP levels because that would be physiologically appropriate. And then just as a reference point, a cutoff of a BNP greater than 100 is often used to diagnose acute CHF exacerbation. So here, here's what we found. So we found that among these three cohorts of people who with severe cardiac dysfunction, about 10% of people who are hospitalized with heart failure and over 20% of people who had abnormal cardiac function or structure based on echocardiogram and, and, um, and by catheterization had BNP levels less than 100. That, uh, that's shown by the green and the, and the orange shading. And interestingly, about five to 10% in each group actually had BNP levels less than 50, which is you know half the threshold that's usually used to diagnose heart failure. So uh, I think a lot of people would argue that that is inappropriately low in the setting of severe cardiac stress. And interestingly, higher BMI was the strongest predictor of unexpectedly low BNP in patients with heart failure. So this led us to conclude that there are some patients with clinical heart failure or cardiac dysfunction have inappropriately low circulating BNP levels, and that these findings would support the existence of NP deficiency in some humans. And furthermore, that obesity appears to be a strong risk factor for NP deficiency. And so I just wanted to kind of conclude briefly on um, an ongoing investigation. So this is a slide I've shown you several times before. And one, you know, one thing that we had also discussed was that NPs in animals appears to promote increases in brown and beige fat. Um, and so if you had a deficiency of NPs, could that lead to uh, lower expression of brown and beige fat and, and to obesity? So in as part of my ongoing um, VA Career Development Award, uh, we're investigating the hypothesis that obese individuals have relative NP deficiencies that contribute to less beige adipose tissue and lower energy expenditure. So in AIM-1, we are determining whether markers of beige adipose tissue um, as assessed by gene expression um, from subcutaneous fat biopsies, um, we're determining if they differ between obese and lean individuals. And furthermore, whether these beige adipose tissue markers and energy expenditure are associated with markers of the natural peptide system, both systemically and locally in adipose tissue. So in conclusion, Animal models and human genetic data suggest that natric peptides exert protect protective effects against adverse cardiovascular and metabolic outcomes. And that a relative NP hormone deficiency may actually exist in some humans. Obese individuals, men and black individuals may be at higher risk of NP deficiency. And it's possible that a relative NP deficiency in these groups may contribute to adverse cardiovascular and metabolic outcomes in these groups. And finally, further investigation is warranted to better understand how NP deficiency, uh, in, uh, better understand NP deficiency in humans, including mechanisms of how it develops and also potential treatments to correct NP deficiency. And finally, I would just love to acknowledge everyone who has really helped with this research and my career development, people at Vanderbilt, my mentors there, my collaborators, my study team members, uh, people at MGH, uh, my mentors and colleagues and, and collaborators here, and so many more that I you know, wasn't able to list everyone, but there were so many people who have helped with this research and helped with my career. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge my funding sources and thank you all so much again. That was fantastic, Catherine. Thank you so much. And I, I'm fascinating about your results, also with the beijing of um, white fat. So let's yes. maybe we will hear from Laura next, and then we can have a question answer session at the end, if that's okay with everyone. Okay, is that better? Great. Okay. Since Karen is applauding, <laughs> Karen, if you have questions, Melanie. Um, anyone here there are some obesity experts but while people are thinking about it so laura i'm very familiar with your work of course mm -hmm. the growth hormone data are so fascinating we um 
but how can we translate that into a drug that people can take growth hormone as you said you have to inject it it's extremely expensive it's very difficult to get uh, what could we do with those data to develop something that actually can be used in clinical yeah. practice because i mean i think that's the, yeah i that's the really cool thing i think about this project is that you can identify sort of a hormone deficiency in obesity and think well what happens if we kind of replace that hormone deficiency um, but, you know, as I sort of whizzed by in the talk, you know, one of the issues with growth hormone is that it can raise blood sugars in some subjects. And so um, the subjects selected for this study um, actually could only have uh, normal glycemic status or prediabetes. And so, um, so for example, that probably excludes a lot of patients that, that couldn't get growth hormone that have NAFLD and NASH. And so the goal of our me mechanistic investigation is really to find, you know, uh, therapeutic targets to basically further define the pathophysiology of disease and see why is growth hormone the you know administration having this effect and and maybe develop more targeted therapies to to those um, mechanisms great thank you any other questions if not catherine i thought that your data on the browning and beijing of wine fat were really fascinating yeah uh, any, any more? Can you shed some light into um, whether this could be or could be used to, I don't know, uh, um, promote browning or beijing or what? It's just a fascinating topic. Like basically, like if there's a kind of a way that this could be done clinically, like clinically, to, yes, no, I, 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 that, I that would be like the city. holy grail, right? Yeah. Yes, <laughs> I know, and so. I mean, I think, I think eventually, potentially. So um, again, you know, kind of with parallel, I think there's so many nice parallels between, <laughs> between kind of both of these talks. So as Laura was saying, like you kind of try to understand the physiology and then I, with a hope of I eventually saying, could we do this to impact patient care? So yeah. uh, what I didn't kind of go into, there's like a whole backstory about, well, what, how can you safely raise natriuretic peptides in people? And can we look at effects of this? So uh, at the beginning of my career development award, I actually had a component of my study where I was infusing natriuretic peptides, which had been FDA approved in the past to treat people with heart failure, got an IND exemption to give it to healthy people mm -hmm. uh, and to look at their effects of uh, on Beijing and on energy expenditure. Mm -hmm. I did, I was able to complete five subjects and then the drug company stopped making it. Oh. Um, and, but there are, there are other ways to kind of get around it uh, or, you know, kind of increase uh, natriuretic peptides. So for instance, interestingly, the uh, PD-5 inhibitors like sildenafil, tadalafil, they do actually increase cyclic GMP activity, which, is you know basically cyclic GMP is the second messenger for natriuretic peptides. So there, it is possible that those agents and there, there are some collaborators here at Vanderbilt who are doing work on that, um, as well as kind of other agents to try to increase natriuretic peptides. So I think that it could be potentially, uh, it could be potential. There could be potential ways to promote uh, promote Beijing like pharmacologically. Great. Casey has a great question. Casey, you can ask it yourself, but I'm not sure whether you have the opportunity technically. Oh, um, I was wondering if you guys see changes in the hormone deficiencies after um, metabolic bariatric surgery. So are they sort of, um, are they um, causal or are they affected by, or are they both, or do we not know yet by the obesity? And is that a question for both Laura and me or one of us? I think for both of you, I'm not skilled enough to say which one. <laughs> I'm not in the know enough. Yeah, so a natriuretic peptides, um, I can speak to natriuretic peptides. Uh, after bariatric surgery, natriuretic peptides do increase. And so again, and the question that you had also, is it causal, is, you know, is it cause or effect? So unclear actually, because, um, you know, at, it, it, we just see that it does, happen after bariatric surgery. And interestingly, a lot of the rise in natriuretic peptides actually occurs prior to weight loss, uh, prior to a lot of weight loss occurring. So it's kind of that, you know, kind of following the uh, interesting hormonal changes after bariatric surgery, where you see a lot of hormonal changes after bariatric surgery, even prior to substantial weight loss. Um, so yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, it's not known, honestly, if it's, you know, cause or effect or potentially both. 
Yeah. And from the growth hormone side, um, and Karen can correct me if I'm wrong, but we had talked about that, that exact actual question. So the, the data that I'm most familiar with is, um, what I like lifestyle weight loss and reversal of the growth hormone secretory abnormalities. But, um, we've talked about that exact clinical question and I, I'm not sure that actually anyone has done this study, but to do, um, a growth hormone stimulation test, um, kind of immediately after bariatric surgery to see if some of these abnormalities reverse just because of some of those, you know, hormonal and metabolic changes that happen right away. Um, and then sort of also do it once the subject has lost weight to see if it's the weight loss itself or some of those hormonal changes, um, as Catherine was alluding to. Um, but I'm not aware that actually anyone has done that yet. But I if you can, seen, yeah, I've, I know I haven't seen any any studies of bariatric surgery, but um, but I but but what what your answer is predicated on are there are these studies that do show that with weight loss from other causes that the that growth hormone does recover yeah. and 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 normalizes, and so um, to answer sort of the part of the question about the chicken or the egg, it is thought that the it's the, you know, that it's the high weight that causes the growth hormone deficiency that having been said, and there are also some great mechanistic studies that show that actually it's free fatty acids that, um, that feed back to suppress growth hormone. And this has been done by um, actually suppressing free fatty acids with the medication called Asipamox. And if that's done, growth hormone goes up. And so, um, you know, it, but as Laura says, um, we don't, you know, that that's sort of the limit. We don't know specifically with bariatric surgery, how that works. And also I, I implied that we know the chicken or the egg, but it's kind of a <laughs> vicious cycle because, you know, once you have low growth hormone, it does contribute to you accumulating fat. So, and de and, and it does um, reduce muscle mass. So it is kind of a, a vicious cycle too, once you get into that cycle. And I was going to say, Casey, if you do bariatric surgery, um, you know, give me an email and we'll talk about it. It'd be great to look at it. it really would be. Um, Amelia, we have, we have blood be, from be inventing our um, adolescent bariatric weight loss program. I think Karen, she might be working with you. Um, I don't know. Who um, are you talking about? Cornelia Griggs. Yeah. So I think maybe we can get on That's board with one. that. That'd be great. Great. Um, there is still, Melanie has one question, is there an experimental stimu stimulation test for NP deficiency, similar to cord stim tests for adrenal insufficiency? Ah, great question, uh, Melanie. We are actually trying, so, so no, there has not been one developed. And I think that's a really good question and something that we are actually, we're trying to figure out. We actually performed a pilot study looking at that, um, that I didn't have time to present the results here. Uh, the tricky thing with that is trying to think of the right stimulus where uh, that where, you know, kind of like with a court stim test, how, you know, with cosentropin, trying to think of the appropriate stimulus um, to promote natriuretic peptide increases. So um, without affecting a lot of other things. So for instance, we know that giving a normal saline infusion produces increases in natriuretic peptides, but then you also, you, that also produces, um, it basically interacts with the, the mineralocorticoid receptors in the renin angiotensin aldosterone system that then also feed back, feeds back on natriuretic peptides. So it's, it's something that I think is really important and something that we are actually still trying to figure out, but no, that, that test does not exist. Uh, but if we, if it did, we, it would help us, you know, understand this a lot better. Great. Thanks for the thank question. You thank you all so much. It is 6.05. Want to be respectful of our people on the East Coast who want to go home. So thank you again, Laura and Catherine. Um, these were really two fascinating talks. And um, thank you for being part of the Klebanski Visiting Scholar Lecture Series. And thank, thank you, you all. Who, thank you, Karen, also um, for doing the great mentoring and being a champion of our faculty. And thank you to all of you who stayed here till 6 p.m. <laughs> Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.